really eager to get into this particular session. I myself was trained back in the 90s in freshwater ecology and toxicology. I used to spend a lot of time um, thinking about water, but sort of light switch went on for me uh, in my studies when I took a class in environmental policy. We learned about the tri-state water wars between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. And for me, it sort of demonstrated that science is not enough. Right? Science is important, but really how science factors into our broader governance of water and natural resources is both fascinating and challenging at the same time. And we're gonna dig into some of those issues um, this afternoon, not just thinking about the Southeast US context, but thinking um, internationally. So glad you're here. So uh, to get this conversation going, I'm joined by three esteemed panelists that uh, I'm really eager to hear from. So um, furthest away from me, we have Banyan Holmatov, who's a water, food, energy nexus research group leader at the International Water Management Institute. In the middle, we have Rosario Sanchez, who is a senior research scientist for the Texas Water Resources Institute an associate graduate faculty of the Water Management and Hydrological Sciences Program at Texas A&M University. And just here to my left, we have Aaron Wolf, a professor of geography at Oregon State University, who also has an appointment as a professor of water diplomacy at IHE Delft Institute for Water Education, a place I actually visited myself uh, a few years ago. So by this point in the day, I think you know the drill. So we're gonna start off with um, sort of a moderated Q&A among myself and the panelists. And then we're gonna to transition to uh, taking your questions um, from the microphones, either here in the room or virtually, depending upon your geography and your preference. So to dive into this conversation, uh, I wanna hear from each of our panelists. I want them to sort of provide their own kind of perspective or entry point into this particular issue of Crown's Battery and Wander transboundary water management, uh, particularly in a changing climate. So Aaron, I'm gonna start with you first. Can you help us sort of problematize this issue? Like what are the big current challenges in transboundary water management and maybe a little bit of how climate change factors in? Yeah, sure, thanks. That's a pleasure to be here and, and thanks to the academies and, and those who've set this up. Um, I think that just to start us off, picking up where, where Ben did, um, the problem of water is, is really, really complicated. On the one hand, we all want to approach it like a technical problem. And um, so there, I, I got my start in, in the University of Wisconsin. I was working for a federal agency there that I won't name, but that um, surveys geology. And, um, uh, and there was a plume of pesticides that was moving from a, a cranberry bog to a municipal uh, well close by. And we were hired to answer the question that was on the municipality's mind, which was, when does the plume hit us, right? Well, so we went and did all the science we could, and we calculated, and we cored, and we modeled, and we did all the things that scientists did, and found out that that plume would hit the well somewhere between five years from now and 50,000 years from now. With really high certainty, I should say. <laughs> So that was kind of the, the moment where I recognized that this, this disconnect between what science can offer and what questions need answering in the human sphere are, is, is vast. And we really need as much training in how human processes work. How do we listen better to each other? How do we problem solve together? And so this got me into this world of kind of water conflict management and transformation. And, and through that, a real understanding that there are four waters, if you will. There's, in the frameworks that I work with, you have physical water, the water that we touch, the water that we move, the water that we carry. We have mental water, where we calculate efficiencies, crop per drop, but we also have emotional water, water tied to history, to sovereignty, to power. And finally, we have spiritual water. Just quick show of hands, how many people here come from a faith tradition that uses water for spiritual transformation? Yeah, everybody does. Even those of you who are too scared to, I know, it's like my <laughs> freshman class, like it's okay to raise your hand. Everybody does. The point is, in the West, we deal with, with the, the technical water really, really well, and we try and leave all that other stuff at the door. And in conflicts, we're trying to solve technical problems where the actual conflict may well be 
about history, sovereignty, power, or spirituality, or all of those together. So we in the West are walking around uh, with, with one eye shut that we shut during the Enlightenment, trying to understand this really complicated set of problems uh, without all of our facilities. Now put international boundaries there. Now you've got 313 basins that cross international boundaries, 60% of drinking water, half the land surface of the earth, and a lot of the people that share basins don't like each other very much. So in the 1990s, a lot of people pointed and, and thought very simplistically, oh look, Arabs and Israelis share water, Indians and Pakistanis share water, Azeris and Armenians share water, we're all running out, climate change is coming, they're all going to war. And that was kind of the prevailing wisdom for a number of years until a lot of people who had training on both the human side and the physical side pushed back and said, wait a second, you've forgotten the institutions that we craft to deal precisely with the problems that we're facing. If you have really good institutions that can deal with variability, that can manage conflict, that can help people have better dialogue, you're not going to uh, blow up in the kinds of ways that you're thinking. And so that dialogue between the water conflict scenario and the water cooperation scenario has been playing out since the 1990s. And I think that's where we are. The, the last point about climate change, in, in, again, in our, in our model, uh, you have two things going on. You have what's happening in the physical watershed, and you have the institutional capacity to deal with that. And both of those are changing. So climate change is bringing us more variability, sometimes more than the treaty or river basin organization can handle, or it's shifting from snow to water, or there's more energy needs because of AI or Bitcoin or, or whatever else. Uh, so those are the things that are shifting, but we also have a rich, rich history now going back 4,500 years in negotiations and in treaty making in river basin organizations that I'm convinced we can draw on to help us make it through uh, these coming changes. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. So, sorry, I'll turn to you. You worked specifically on, on groundwater. Uh, I'm, I'm based in Southern California, so we hear about water and groundwater constantly. It's a constant refrain, but I think many of us take it for granted. So, what does this look like from your perspective, and particularly what's different maybe about transboundary issues related to groundwater versus surface water? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I guess if what Aaron was discussing seems difficult, groundwater is truly, really difficult. <laughs> but just by the fact that you have to try, um, because you don't see. So everything, uh, when we talk about surface water and all the challenges that we have to face, just think about that when you actually do not see it. And when you actually share it, um, currently over the 400 or so transboundary aquifers recognized depends on the definition, right? That we use because you have to negotiate that too. If we think about a definition of, of an aquifer here domestically, well, you just go to USGS and you just follow a very standard definition. But when, when you have an aquifer that is shared between one or two countries, you have to negotiate that too. What is groundwater, right? What are the limits of that, of that system? How do you measure? How do you know? How can I trust you? And everything, the emotional, the spiritual, the history, everything comes into play. So at the end of the day, you do not negotiate water. You negotiate something else. Either you know complexes, either history of other needs, other priorities, even. So it becomes even more complicated and more challenging, because as as compared to surface water, we have less data when it comes to groundwater, <clears throat> especially transboundary aquifers. And if we think about just locally, between well, locally for me, I'm in Texas. <laughs> I'm in, now I'm in the north. I'm in the north. Uh, or even in the northern part too, as well. Uh, it's very, very limited data you can play with. Very, very limited elements that you can use for negotiation purposes. So it's everything is kind of uh, out in the blind and it becomes much, much more challenging. 
And if you think about negotiation processes, and you don't have enough data, so and I and I, and I, I learned this from you. <laughs> What's the minimum amount of data that you have to get to make a decision? So we as scientists always think that we need more data. We need more data, more data, more data. <clears throat> Especially when it comes to groundwater and physics of the system, it's very complex. And you all, you will never have that certainty necessary to make decisions, not a transparent detail. So what is the minimum amount of data you can deal with? And then you have to convince, right? And other stakeholders from the other side. So I will, leave it, I will leave it with that, just to make you aware that there's a whole new world and that whole new world, it's linked with the surface water. So we need to recognize that they're different. They're part of the same family, it's like husband and wife relationship. They're not the same. The family doesn't work if they don't work each other. We going to work each other. I will leave it with that, with that analogy. <laughs> Great, thanks, Rosario. And um, yeah, I think you raised the really important topic of data. We're going to circle back on that a little bit later because I think that, that issue of what's the minimum amount of information we actually need to make decisions, I think is good, it's going to be key. Uh, okay, so last thing I want to turn to, to you, Bunyan. And, you know, Obviously, we're concerned about water, but one of the reasons why we're concerned about water is because of what water does for us, the service it provides in terms of things like food, in terms of energy. You, know, you work at the sort of nexus of the food, water, energy, food, water, energy. Yeah, that nexus. So tell us a little bit more about that nexus, why it's important, and what is the relationship between the sort of the interaction between these three different systems um, and transboundary water management? Great. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> so I also want to uh, thank the organizers of the event. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so with regards uh, to the nexus, to start with the basics, nexus is just a word. It means linkages, right? And it's been used in different fields uh, from last century. Uh, so anything from medicine to uh, finance. But why it became so important in the uh, field of environmental science is from the famous 2011 Bonn Conference, uh, the water, energy, food, uh, security nexus solutions to the green economy. There it was uh, promoted as an approach where if we uh, capture the um, uh, synergies between the, these different uh, interlinked sectors, then uh, we can reap more benefits than if we pursue solutions uh, in silos. So that was the whole idea of why um, Nexus uh, be became important in the field of uh, environmental science. And actually, all these three sectors, water, energy, and food, they're very important for the climate change because most of the climate change impacts will be felt through water, while energy is the largest contributor to, to climate change. And food also the same way, it's, uh, it's at risk from climate change, but it also contributes like the rice fields, you know, they emit uh, methane and we use a lot of our input in, the, uh, in our food systems, which uh, again, contribute to climate change. Um, so impact of climate change on WEF uh, nexus can also, when, when we link it with transboundary water management, it can complicate it, but it also makes the whole uh, negotiations more important. Uh, I come from Central Asia, which basically refers to five former Soviet, Soviet republics, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. And there we can see uh, nexus and transboundary issues very much interlinked. Because during the Soviet times, uh, they're just known for the legacy of building large infrastructure. They have one of the world's tallest dam. They have one of the uh, longest canals. And they did that because they, um, the upstream countries uh, in Central Asia, they do not have uh, as much uh, endowment in fossil fuels. So they depend on uh, generating their uh, power from hydropower. While the downstream countries, we are endowed with uh, fossil fuels, but uh, we need water for irrigation. But the timing of releases during the Soviet times, it was negotiated by the Moscow. So these multi-purpose dams, you know, where the downstream countries supplied energy in return for releasing water during the vegetation period. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the whole um, uh, dynamics changed. 
Now uh, the upstream countries want to release water during cold months when the downstream countries don't need water, right? Uh, so it, uh, th that's where we can see the WEF nexus complications very much. And I work uh, uh, for IVMI, which is a research for development organization. Um, and we have a number of uh, projects in the region which focuses on the nexus, like uh, specific nexus and transboundary issues. One of them is called Nexus Gains. It's a, a CGIR initiative. And there we have a number of work packages, but one of them, for example, in work package one, um, uh, we're <clears throat> looking at the foresight methodology. So for example, with the climate change, there is changes in water supply and also there's increasing demand, right? But uh, the, the, what the countries want to do is increase their storage capacity. But what does it do to the uh, shared water resources? Like if you build uh, an our multipurpose dam. So before we invest that, we want to uh, capture that in the models to see how it will basically affect the distribution of water, water availability at different nodes of the system. So that's, for example, one of the activities that we're doing. And, and in our one, uh, we're uh, using remote sensing techniques, the new uh, techniques to actually map alternative water storage. Because in Central Asia, um, it's whenever we're talking about storage, we're talking about gray infrastructure. But there are also options to uh, use alternative uh, water storage options, be it groundwater, for example, or soil moisture. So mapping those alternatives and then uh, giving those uh, to the decision makers to say, hey, maybe you don't need to uh, build uh, um, uh, great infrastructure. Maybe you can utilize some of the um, uh, some of the existing alternative water storage options. Um, so I guess I will um, stop at that. Thank you. Great. No, thank, thank you. So, okay. So I think by this point, you have to have a feel for what our panelists are passionate about and where their expertise lies. This is, however, climate crossroads. I want to dig in a little bit more on the, on the climate piece of this. Uh, I want to turn back to you, Rosario. You know, we hear a lot lately about climate change, drought, aridity in the U.S. Southwest. We've also heard a lot about it in places like Mexico and Mexico City, which has been struggling with water availability, at least reportedly. So can you sort of talk about that particular context? How does climate change impact groundwater? Um, and particularly, how does that complicating some of the relationships between, say, US and Mexico in terms of water resource use? Well, we tend to think that groundwater is much more resilient to climate, uh, climate change. But since we think that, that is actually working against us uh, because of the number of, you know, of everybody's turning into groundwater now because it's much more of a time to increase in temperature. So our pumping has been increasing, especially on the southern part of West, and, you know, we can see that uh, very easily. On the border between Mexico and the U.S., around usually the traditional number is between 7 to 8 million people depend solely on transboundary groundwater resources. But when there's drought, that number easily increases to 10 million people. Because we cannot rely on certain water anymore. Actually, our international dams are below 20%, and it seems like this for over the years, causing a lot of issues between Mexico and the US. So the, the yes, groundwater is much more resilient in its natural state. But since we don't have enough surface water or for current growth, Oh, this is my fault. I'm sorry. No, it's me. Oh. oh. <laughs> I told you something. Was gonna I'm sorry. Okay. Let's start all over again. <laughs> Did you guys hear it? No? Well, it doesn't care. Okay. <laughs> you got the fun part. Okay. So the reliance on groundwater is increasing. So that resiliency effect that we think we have in groundwater is just working against us, uh, is putting groundwater at risk because we don't know much about groundwater. So we're relying on, you know, on a credit card that we don't know the interest rate or something like that, or savings account. We're using savings account right now without knowing how much money we actually have to be spending. In terms of and apart from that, we don't have a regulatory system that regulates groundwater in the border or 
uh, worldwide, we have, I believe, seven or eight transboundary groundwater agreements, and not necessarily of them deal with management, but just sharing data, because that's a big thing to share data. And the rest is just, you know, we rely on that without managing at transboundary scale. And this is true for US Mexico, it's true for, for US Canada, it's true for most of the world. So knowing this, the, the challenges are just adding up to that list of layers that I explained before. And it becomes more, more, more visible. The challenges are becoming much more visible. In the case of the drought that is hitting not just Mexico City, I think the drought is everywhere. But yes, Mexico is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. Um, I honestly don't know why, but I've seen, uh, I've seen what's going on in there. And, and Mexico City is one of the largest countries in the world that it's increasingly relying more on groundwater with subsidence issues. Uh, the zero day uh, is suspected to be in 15 or so years. Uh, and the city, it's still operating as usual, as nothing is actually happening. I guess when you have too many issues, too many priorities, too many challenges at the same time, you just lose sight of each one of them. Uh, and, and that's the way the city is operating. The, the big Kutsamala system that brings water to the city for over 300 kilometers against gravity, actually, it's pumped water from outside of the basin, loses the same, one, the same amount of water that actually gets into the system. So it's a, it's a surreal case uh, from my perspective um, that, I don't know, we, we still need to figure out what's going on, but yes, with the new uh, precedent now in place, a lot of expectation has come in terms of water and the water agenda. Not sure what actually the, the federal government will be able to do because this, is, this has gone beyond federal government. Uh, we need to do more on a local scale, especially when it comes to groundwater. Groundwater is very, very local as compared to surface water. It's very attached to communities, it's very attached to history, so the local approaches need to uh, really be worked out in a way that it's understandable, in a way that people and stakeholders are part of the solutions and they become aware of what's going on. Ag again, how do they become aware if we don't have enough data, right? And we don't have enough transparency also uh, of that information, it's a taboo, so you name it. Thanks, Rosario. And as you mentioned, it's not just sort of Mexico, but we're seeing these kinds of problems pop up again and again and again with increasing frequency, both in terms of individual municipalities, but also broader regional areas. Um, so, so Aaron, this is all this is all fascinating, right? Scientifically, socially, economically, we as researchers find this stuff cool to study, but it has real impacts on people and people's lives and people's livelihoods and, and communities. So what does the solution look like? How do we get different actors, whether it's nation states or districts to work together to try and get out in front of these so we're not just ignoring the problems that we can see down on, on the horizon, we're actually dealing with them in the present day? A great question. I, I, I think part, one of the interesting things about water is, is precisely the things that we, we think might bring us towards conflict also induce dialogue. So if we think about a drought, for example, or, or a series of droughts, or, or a plume of, 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 of a, um, pollution, all of these things you would think, oh my gosh, they hate each other and it's crossing borders, this is going to bring conflict. But what it does, if, if we look actually, it forces people's attention, it brings resources, it brings people to uh, the table, sometimes in secret, if they don't have relations, uh, to, to a point where they'll try to have these discussions. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the key messages is better conversations earlier is, is profoundly important. I think what, what both you and Rosario mentioned um, is that there's a difference between um, water scarcity or, or uh, 
water, water insecurity leading to horrible death and destruction, which it does. There's no question. Millions of people die because they don't have access to it. It brings disease, um, environmental degradation. All of this is happening. And, and, and a separate question is around uh, harder security issues, conflict, cooperation. And sometimes we end up conflating this. Like, look, people are dying. Yes, they're dying. It is, is the incentive then to go across the border and attack the neighbor? And so it's that second part that I think doesn't happen very often. Um, it's, it's embarrassing talking about it. Aaron Salzberg, who's sitting here, was the point person of, uh, for, for international water in the State Department for decades and, and is, has been in, in a lot of those rooms. Um, so I hope he doesn't say anything to contradict me. But I, I think this is the important point. Water, whether we're talking internationally, it brings people in a room who won't sit in the room together and gives them something really important to talk about. And at the subnational level, I work all over the West, uh, little bitty basins that nobody's ever heard of where you've got environmentalists, you've got ranchers, you've got city people um, willing to talk together because we recognize that, that with this resource, different than any other resource, the only way to work through our, our crises is through better dialogue, through better management, through uh, more creative uh, problem solving. And, and again, the record is there. Uh, if you look at the Jordan Basin, for example, they ran out of water in 1968. I mean, demand hit supply in 1968. This is Arabs and Israelis, not a very uh, Pacific uh, place to be. And everything that's happened in, in all of those years, all the economies growing, the, the um, demographics growing, the uh, immigration from, from Russia, from the Gulf, Everything that happened, happened through greater efficiencies, greater problem solving, greater uh, dialogue when it, was, when it was possible. So I think, um, I think it has the potential to bring people in the room. And what we want to do is make sure, as you pointed out, that, uh, that folks are coming in who historically have, haven't had uh, the opportunity to be in that room. OK, so this is another example of not letting a crisis go to waste. Right. Okay. Uh, I want to follow up on that because essentially what you're talking about is environmental diplomacy right. to some extent. Um, there's a sort of argument or narrative that, you know, actors that have trouble having conversation around other topics might be able to come together and find common cause around some of our environmental challenges. Do you see that playing out in the real world? I think in the water world for sure. And, uh, and, and I, I'm only a water guy. I don't know anything about anything else. I don't even know a lot about salt water. So I, 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 I know this is true in the water world because I've sat in the room with the people who don't have agreements. I've, I've, I've been in a room where one country, they don't recognize the other country, but they recognize that they have to be able to, the scientists have to be able to work with each other to identify um, uh, pollution hotspots. And so they've sent secret delegations and sat in the you know, basement of some international chain in the capital, um, hoping against hope that word of these people being there would not get out because they'd be in, in physical danger. So I know this happens, I, and I know it happens a lot. And again, Aaron could probably tell a lot more stories uh, about it happening. And, and I, I want to come back. I mean, you know, not to let a crisis go to waste. I think what we're trying to learn how to do is have the crisis mentality well in advance of the crisis, right? If we know, if we see the cliff, you know, 100 miles away, now's the time to start working on it, right? Not waiting until, um, until all these things are going to, to bring the attention. Okay, great. So if part of the solution is getting people in the room, knowledge sharing, building networks, Bunyod, I think you have a specific example of this. So you work, um, we're part of the peer-to-peer -peer network that uh, is established um, as part of the National Academies. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that's being used um, to help build relationships and networks in transboundary water management? Sure. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer is uh, ba basically something that enables trust and building and then also exchanging best practices. Um, so we are part of the peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's uh, actually an 
uh, AxelNet Award by the U.S. National Science Foundation to the National Academy of Sciences in Engineering Medicine, uh, University of California, Irvine, and Oklahoma State University. It's also um, co-financed by the USAID. And there the vision is uh, the, basically to establish a global network of regional water networks <laughs> to uh, basically promote exchange, integration, discovery among U.S. researchers and also uh, counterparts from Central Asia, Middle East, and North Africa. Um, and the current and former uh, grantees are the part of the network uh, who were uh, part of the peer uh, project financed by the USAID. Um, and I have to say, uh, IVMI was part of that, uh, that uh, peer uh, project in the past. And one of the activities that we've done is um, so in, uh, in Uzbekistan, about 20% of uh, the produced electricity goes into uh, water supply, basically, to convey water. So in the global average, is about 5%. So that's way higher than the global average. And that's because almost every second uh, hectare of irrigated land uh, uses water that's been lifted. Um, and in certain places, we have installations where cascade of pumps lift water uh, 100 to 150 meters um, to irrigate land. So that's very inefficient use of uh, energy, right? And that's where we can also see the nexus between water, food, and energy. So uh, when we were part of that uh, project, what we've done is actually been able to show that you can reduce water that's being lifted uh, because now you're applying excess water to uh, irrigate fields. So if we apply water saving technologies, that would translate into reducing energy that's used to pump water um, uh, while we're not going to lose any uh, reduction in the crop yields. Um, so when we, and plus, because the energy is produced using fossil fuels, we're also contributing to climate mitigation. So when we uh, presented that research, um, the government of uh, Uzbekistan reacted by basically supporting farmers um, who invest in water saving technologies by subsidizing those technologies. So they return between 40 to 50 percent of the costs. So that was a, a, a huge success. And that's like the type of uh, type of knowledge that now we're sharing uh, in peer to peer. And this is the third year of the program. And this year, we're basically uh, uh, focusing on lessons for managing transboundary water resource uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and if anyone is interested, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer will be holding a session at the AGU. Um, so you can, you're welcome to um, uh, submit an ab abstract, because we're going to have a session on transboundary water management. So uh, many of the people in this room will probably be interested in that. So yeah, that's the, that, that, that's how uh, we're using peer-to-peer. -peer. Great, thanks for that. Uh, specific examples of how we're tackling these issues sort of in place and at scale, but also the knowledge sharing piece, right? So once we've learned about something that works, how do we disseminate that information out so others can benefit from it? Um, all right, I wanna circle, I said I was gonna circle back on the data question. So I'm gonna circle back on the data question. Um, you know, this seems to be particularly, I wanna, try and reflect upon this morning session around AI, right? So everybody, you know, as researchers, we're always data hungry. We want to have more information for our modeling to draw conclusions. Decision makers always want to have data to justify their particular decisions. Um, this is, I, I, I always look at sort of the water arena as a place that's very data rich because of the importance of, of water, but at the same time, it's very data poor. You know, to resort to your point, you know, if we can't see it, it's very hard to, to measure it. Um, so I'm gonna throw this open to all three of you because I think all three of you sounds like you have an experience in this space, but um, given the importance and the value that we place on water, you know, I wanna talk about this issue of sort of what's minimum amount of data that's needed. So what data do we need? What data we'd like to have? What can we do more of if we had more data or, or is it sufficient? <laughs> I'm with her. <laughs> Good. I, I put it on now. Yeah, I yeah, I have no idea. I mean, it all depends on who you're talking to, um, who you want to talk to, and and sometimes 
even when you have the data or some data, the, the message is not being delivered correctly. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, or I, I guess we have a mission as a scientist that apart from producing data and generate knowledge and science, I think we're missing the last step, how to communicate that science into you know the sectors the communities that we need to that we are supposed to be impacting by this knowledge i believe we have missed that step and that's very true when it comes to transboundary waters or transboundary aquifers which is very technical i mean aquifer research is very very technical uh, and then you try to communicate this, whatever data, available data you have to stakeholders that have never ever read about this. So it's, it's like the trans, translation of that science into something that is actually usable, practical, and understandable to a lay audience. I think that's the best way that I can describe because we as scientists, we need more data, we need more data, but the people that actually make decisions they don't need more data. They want answers and they want to understand the problem. And sometimes we miss that link. Like, what do you want to know? So sometimes, you know, we, we go to those meetings and we present our big maps and these are the transvander, and then they say, so what? What do you want me to do with that? And they are right. I mean, what do we want them to do with that? So what is, what is the overall objective of producing this science with what purpose? and who are going to actually have, you know, affect and have an impact at the end of the day without science. So I think that's the question that we need to answer ourselves because I, there's no way we're never get, gonna get enough data. But if we are able to figure out what the question is that people are trying to answer, I think it's easier for us to, to accommodate our, avail, our available data or request of the, or field work or everything that we need to do on the back end. I guess, to give that answer with a modest level of certainty. The data for data's sake is probably not very helpful without understanding the specific context of what people need, which I think, you know, if you learn anything from the whole dialogue around co-production of knowledge, that's the, the starting point is for what are you trying to do? What are your objectives? And I'm gonna give you a quick example because I want you guys to uh, say on this, but. Originally, we thought that we actually needed an agreement between US and Mexico on transboundary aquifers. We thought, and I, and I assumed that, we assumed that, right? We should have an agreement. And then we go out there and we do actually a field, field work and figure out what the stakeholders would actually need or want. And the answer was the opposite. No, we don't want a transboundary water with an agreement. We want a local scale approach arrangement which are not necessarily binding, that are much more efficient, and they respond to our special particular needs of the region. So that, for me, was shocking. It was kind of, oh my God, I mean, we are assuming that people need this and what they actually want and need and makes a total sense is this. So I learned that the hard way, by the way. Aaron, yeah, no, I, I, I love this example. And, and I like the way you couch the question. And, and, and it probably needs another clause because it said, how much data do we need? And, and so what Rosario is asking is, for what? To totally understand the system, we'll be here forever, right? And that's, I have friends in the, I'm in the uh, climate side of, of OSU, and they think if only they get the right amount of data, suddenly everybody will believe them. And it's not going to happen. And no matter how much data they get on in their climate change model and how many significant figures, there's going to be a population that simply is not going to believe them. It has nothing to do with the data. So if the, if the for what is to, to come to an agreement on next steps, it turns out that the amount of data you need is actually not very much. And, and what you do then is develop, as you mentioned, a joint process to collectively, collaboratively start to work to understand the system better. And that's that in and of itself, you don't end up with competing models. People are willing to, um, even if it's not as good science, at least it's their science, and they, and they can work with that. 
So um, I'll, I'll give another example, because you mentioned the tri-state, the uh, ACT and the ACF, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. My first academic job was the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, anybody here know? Um, so, um, so in the middle of this, right, 90 inches of rain, and they still have, they still find stuff to fight over. And one of the questions was, you know, Georgia is sucking up all the water in the head, in the headwaters, and they need um, fishing and, and environmental protection down in the delta. And they're arguing, they're negotiating. At one point, they just turned to the biologists who were responsible for the delta. It's like, how much water do you need and when? Tell us now. It's like, oh my God, no, we need to do a 10-year baseline study and then maybe the baseline has changed and we have to check our this and we have to check our that. For a scientist, tell us now is a, is a frightening, frightening proposition. And they said, that's great, you have a month. So what they do, they got 10 experts, people who've been working in the Delta their entire lives, and they said to the 10 experts, draw us a hydrograph based on your gut. And not literally, but based on their, their understanding of the system. And all 10 of them did it. Nine of them were identical. And the one that didn't, they said, oh, why not? And they thought, thought about the assumptions going in and what actually happens with precipitation. He changed his, all 10 of them from their instinct were able to come up with a hydrograph. So the point is that our data may come from lots of sources that don't include kind of the latest measurement. It can come from, from indigenous knowledge. It can come from local use, people who've been, you know, eighth generation farmers know an awful lot about their stream that may not be captured um, and, and finally, I think we're getting a lot more with, with AI, with satellites. We can tell streams and reservoirs, but we'll never know if we can tell what, what a reservoir is doing now. We'll never know when they will and won't uh, turn the floodgates on, right? That's, and so we, we still need to figure out better trust, more collaboration, and, and working together even as we find out more information. Great. Onion, anything yeah, so on I, data? Yeah, so I totally, I totally agree. I think yeah. everything was already said. You know, it's a, it like depends on uh, why. Like, uh, you know, when is it enough? It's like, what do you want to do? Um, so just to also give an example, um, again coming from the water energy uh, food nexus perspective, right? Like, if it's so difficult to get just data for water sector itself, imagine when we have to capture also data for food and energy system, because then we're talking about different scales, different actors, different units, different institutions, right? So the whole complexity just becomes, whoa, um, you know, something very difficult to manage. But still, uh, we're, we're, there are some models that we can use to capture that complexity. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the, the data, um, may exist, but it's not necessarily accessible or not in the right format that the models need. So then what it becomes, it's a very important, like uh, what was already said, partnerships. You know, you need to work with the end users. Um, who is going to use like uh, whatever the outputs from those models, right? And for what? Um, and one of the things they ask is, can you show me results? Like what, what can it do? Uh, but you know, with these new modeling techniques, with the new AI-induced uh, models, sometimes they're like uh, capturing complexity means that, you know, it's, it's not easy and then you need a lot of data input. And if the quality of the data is not good, then garbage in, garbage out. Um, or if you don't have enough data. So then, um, you know, what we're trying to do is simplify these systems just so we show the results on a smaller scale. So scale becomes very important because the larger scale means more data. So we can um, zoom in, um, uh, use the data that we know or have uh, at a smaller scale, uh, that do that modeling, uh, show the results to the stakeholders. And once we have their buy-in, then uh, we can go at the larger scale because then they will be interested in supplying that data because they know uh, what they will get in return for investing that type of data. Right. Yeah. Well, my my story about the tri-state water war and what I learned back in the '90s is sort of to stay out of the courts. The courts sent the states away and said, "Go collaborate, do modeling on all of your basins, figure out an allocation scheme that works for everybody." And so they all agreed and we went away and did the modeling. And not surprisingly, the modeling did not reveal a solution that made everybody happy. And so they went, "No." You reject the modeling and just you know back into the courts. So 
uh, sometimes all the data and technology in the world doesn't necessarily solve your, your policy issue. Um, okay, uh, we, I'm gonna do one more. Before I do that, um, I wanna prompt all of you who have been waiting quite patiently. If you've got questions of yourselves, now's the time to jot that down, formulate your question, head over to the microphone. If you're listening in virtually or online, um, get your, your question queued up in Slido. If you're quick, you might be the first question we ask because we're going to start with a Slido of questions. Okay. Um, so that's your cue to get started. Um, last question for me for this group. Um, I want to circle back on um, the sort of local scale nature of this. So when you were talking about sort of this small scale effort. So we've been talking a lot about sort of national disputes and, you know, across the U.S. Mexico border. What about local communities? So, how do we ensure that the sort of concerns, preferences, needs of local communities are being addressed in these sort of broader interstate geopolitical transboundary disputes? I'm asking. I'm certainly not asking myself because I don't know. <laughs> so, I'm asking any one of you that feels like you have something to say on this. Um, sure, sure. So let me uh, get, give one of the examples. So, um, you know, with Oregon State, we're now part of this uh, project that is funded by, by the um, uh, State Department. IUCN is also part, Shared Water Resources. Um, so there we're looking at how can we uh, basically improve cooperation in some of the uh, river basins where uh, the cooperation is not doing well, right? So one of the things we chose was a small tributary. Um, and um, which is shared between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan in Central Asia. Um, and we realized that, you know, it's, it's so difficult to initiate uh, cooperation in these rivers because a lot of times it's political, it's like at a higher level. But then the practitioners, people who are really working with, uh, with the water resources are at the very local scale. And they have a lot of needs and wishes which we think it can really benefit if, if taken up. Right, so um, what we tried to do is assess, okay, can we then go into any uh, kind of river basin and try to understand the real barriers uh, for cooperation in those river basins? And we developed a rapid assessment process um, where we uh, took 10 indicators, um, uh, which is like, that, does the agreement exist, for example, right? Is there data exchange, uh, for example? and we um, did triangulation of uh, results. So we first reviewed literature. What does literature say about, uh, about uh, um, answers to those indicators? And once we did that, we went and we talked to the local stakeholders. You know, and that benefited so, so much. Um, you know, we interviewed uh, practitioners. Uh, and then after that, we brought the both sides together in a workshop. And there we invited also people from the ministries, from the um, higher level. And this was an amazing moment when all these people from different uh, levels could jointly then develop some of the recommendations based on the barriers that were identified uh, through this RAP process. Um, so that was like one of the, uh, for example, ways we realized that we can take the um, local voices and connect them with the uh, with the uh, higher scale uh, decision making. Another way um, I know some of uh, our colleagues at IVMI, because we have 15 uh, offices around the world, um, so they're, uh, they're using uh, multi stakeholder platforms, which are also one of the ways you can uh, give voice to the local uh, uh, communities to express their concerns. So those would be the, the two answers from my side, thanks. Yeah, well, that's a great example, particularly how you work from the bottom up yeah. as opposed to from the top down. So. Zario? I think uh, apart from, from what it has been said, on my end, I would, I would add a lot of patience, <laughs> a lot of respect, um, especially for differences, for values, for perspectives. We probably need to stop talking about water rights and turn the discussion a little bit into water benefits. Water rights brings people very 
you know, they get them very nervous. But when you talk about water benefits, it's something else. And the same goes, and I'm talking about, you know, from my experience, uh, water quality, environmental concerns brings people, are more friendly <laughs> to bring people together to the table than water rights. How much water you have to have? It's not a good question to ask in Texas, um, for example. Uh, but if you talk about water quality, if it, because it's, it has more impact, at, you know, socially, and it has a safety, health concern, public health concern, so brings people together more easily. And, and the other one is, believe it or not, science is negotiable. Perspectives, values, culture is not negotiable. So it is easier um, to negotiate science and to negotiate, and we should be able to identify what exactly is the source of conflict. Is it water, is it the science, or is it something that we are not able to identify? So that's the more complicated part, but is the most important part. Uh, and, and of course, and, and that helps you build trust over the long term. You know, you have to be persistent and, and very resilient. Uh, I am originally from Mexico, I was born and raised and educated actually in Mexico. And then when I came to the US and I was working for Texas and I knew my colleagues on the Mexico side, they were kind of confused. Who do I work for, right? Who do you represent? What are your interests? What are your values? And the easy uh, door for me was to say, well, I work for the basin. And I truly work for the basin. So I don't know if they believe that or not. Uh, but that's the only way I can get out. So it, it matters at the end of who you are talking to and what do you actually represent. Is there anything else? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I mean, I think within the water world and, and maybe the larger environmental world, I think there's real recognition that there does need to be uh, input from, from the public. I don't know if that's true at the kind of transboundary negotiation level. I, at the minimum, all you really need to figure out is what the, the quantity, quality, and timing is of water at the border. That's really the only thing you need to figure out. Um, and so we had a treaty in my base, in the Columbia Basin, uh, between the U.S. and Canada signed in 1960 that had figured that out quite elegantly and had figured out the benefits if, if they built four dams together and they focused on hydropower and flood control, you could grow the benefits. Um, and, and it was a good treaty, except that it didn't take into account at all any of the indigenous needs in the basin. It, uh, it cut off uh, the, the migration of salmon to Canada and didn't take into account environmental uh, needs at all and didn't take into account public participation at all. So that was 1960. And then as, as the, it starts to, to come to some of the, the clauses end up ending like now, uh, and so we've been renegotiating um, a new treaty over the last 10 or 15 years. And they just last week, it was really interesting, came out with, a, with the principles of a modernized treaty that does in fact take into account uh, the environment, does uh, try, uh, agrees to study the migration of fish into uh, Canada, has an indigenous advisory uh, board that now has a place for indigenous voices and has no clause whatsoever for public participation. So, and in contrast, and in parallel, the same week, the Nile Basin Initiative uh, entered into law because the sixth country, South Sudan, signed on to, this is a treaty between uh, the upper, well, it's for all the Nile Basin, um, and that has a really rich, nuanced, sophisticated public participation mechanism. So now here we are in the Pacific Northwest um, trying to figure out how to get these guys from the Nile to come teach our people how to manage our 
damn water and let them have some public participation uh, going on because you can't, I mean, you can't not. We know what's going on, as, as everybody here has said. We know what's going on on the ground. We know what our values are. We know we have much more in common across the border than we do oftentimes with the rest of the country. And so doing any kind of treaty these days without some mechanism for input just is, is, is counterproductive. That part seems to have gotten left out of the modern treaty, the modern treaty. Uh, yeah. label. No yeah. people. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, everybody. OK, so over to you. Please make your way to a microphone if you have questions for our panel. Um, I'm assuming we have a question on the Slido that we can start with. Yes, we do, while people are getting set up at the in-person mic. So our first question from our online audience is, what roles or involvement have you seen non-country or non-governmental bodies like industrial polluters play in water cooperation conversations and decision making? Fascinating question. Who wants to tackle that one? No. Nobody wants to I'll, tackle that. I'll, I'll do it. I don't, <laughs> I don't care. I got tenure. So. Um, <laughs> No, I, th I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming the way the question is is couched is is what detriment do certain people bring, and 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 it's true. There's uh, if be, because of the way structures are set up, a lot of uh, parties can get away with with doing a lot of things that they probably shouldn't be doing. Now, if the question is is how do you address that? I've seen some really um, kind of elegant ways. There's a um, if you have a river basin organization um, that has collective decision making, and there will be um, kind of stakeholder representatives for for different bodies. I've seen a couple of basin organizations where somebody represents the river itself, which is really really powerful. That, that the river has to agree to anything, and oftentimes an environmental NGO will represent. Um, will represent the environment writ, writ large, and um, uh, polluters also have a seat at the table to be able to help figure out how do we collectively uh, address um, address the, the problem of pollution. And, and over and over, I think, when, when that conversation happens, collaboratively, there are many, many more options than there are uh, not. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that, unless you want to add. Yes, I think we have to be inclusive, everyone. I mean, they're big stakeholders, and we actually want them on the table. And they have to be on the table. So if we really want to make a difference or have an impact on decision making, they have to be involved. So the good and the bad together. Yeah, it's a sort of analogous conversation, I guess, in that, that happened at the COP meeting, right, recently, where it was you know, should, should oil states have a seat at the table in terms of negotiating climate agreements? And, you know, I was like, well, of course they should. But, of course, not everybody necessarily agrees with that. All right. Got a nice line brewing here. Question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Laurie Krieger. I'm here on my own, but I'm with Clean Cities Blue Ocean and USAID program. Um, what I haven't heard you talk about, I mean, I, first of all, thank you very much. It's really informative. What I haven't heard you talk about is power differentials and corruption. Mm. Um, I'm thinking, for example, there's a very well-studied Australian case study where a mine, mining company upstream was number one, using a lot of the water, and number two, polluting the, the water um, for the ranchers and the farmers downstream, and they won. And they won because they had the money and the power. So, um, and it was across states in Australia. Um, and I also was very surprised about the input community input into, I worked on that Nile Basin in the 90s. And let me tell you, there wasn't community input. I was doing a study to find out how they would accept what they were being forced to do. So I found that very curious. But my question is, where does corruption and power differentials fit in? Thanks. OK. I'm going to get fired after this. <laughs> I think that we need, um, I, I learned this in Spanish, let me try to, it is what it is, right? We are not trying to, we should not be trying to change the world, as you know, corruption is everywhere. Um, 
it is as good as it gets, is what we have to deal with, is those are the cards that we have to play with, for good or for bad. And we have to be realistic uh, of, I mean, we can do as good as we can. We can try. And we're always going to be there, right? Um, we're old enough to, I guess, well, I don't know me. Uh, I'm old enough, yeah, to know what's good and what's bad. Um, but I don't know, I mean, we can't control the world. We can't control the forces of nature, uh, as, you know, or forces of human uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, I will leave it with that. It is what it is. I'll, I'll just add just a bit. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, you know, in our little transboundary water world, it, we can't take on you know global corruption. But but I think within the room we can. And so I'll just give I'll just tell you what what I try and do. Any any process that I'm facilitating, you always start with um, what are what are our um, how are we going to know we've come to a good agreement, right? What are the performance criteria for a good agreement? We do that on the front end. And inevitably on that list is it has to be sustainable, it has to be just, it has to be equitable. And so whatever's happening in the room, and I've seen a lot of times where power gets equalized, where there's a, there's a hegemon maybe, but there's also counter hegemonic kind of forces. All the non-hegemons get together and kind of gang up on the, on the hegemon. So the power in the room tends to, um, uh, to be equalized. But at the end of the day, once they're moving towards an actual agreement, then we come back to our performance criteria and ask, is what we're doing sustainable, equitable, just? And that's the only place that I have any levers um, is to help the process be thoughtful about exactly those issues. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm also honest enough with myself to recognize what little party part that I have if within that room excludes a whole bastion of, of things that you're talking about. I think it's an important reminder that I think Australian example is an interesting one of, you know, this is the laws work differently depending upon where you are um, in the world. And that has a big impact on what's what what can't be done and what can't be done. I was in Australia during the, the, the 2000s of the big drought and seeing what was happening, not just with mining, but just landowner, large landowners buying up the water entitlements from small landowners because that was the only commodity they had left that was worth anything. Uh, but that speaks directly to this issue of power and consolidation of power. All right, let's, uh, um, do we have another, we have another slide out, then we'll come back to the microphone here. Yep, our next online question is, the World Meteorological Organization of the United Nations, which contributes to the IPCC, has 193 member countries, yet the World Water Council only has 52 member countries. Should there be a World Water Organization of the UN? Wouldn't this help confront issues facing transboundary watersheds with increasing population and the climate crisis? Ha, great question. That's simple, right? That's just a yes or no. Uh, yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie, yeah, that's yours. I think this is more Aaron's. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, right. I, look, what I've seen, and I, again, only speaking for myself, there's only so much you can do at the global level for principles. I mean, and, and we've done them. There, there are some legal principles. International water use should be reasonable and equitable. It should not cause significant harm. You should uh, notify appropriately the other, your neighbors to what you're doing. But at some point, all water's local. I mean, it, it just is. And so I, th I think there's something useful about data collection like WMO. I think, you know, figuring out what's happening globally around the hydrologic cycle is important and having a database of all the agreements um, that, that we do have at Oregon State University may be useful so people can tap into each other's experience. But at the end of the day, agreements get negotiated at the basin level. And if you go to any basin in the world, the first thing they'll tell you is they're unique, they're unlike any place else in the world, and what are you doing here as a foreigner? You know nothing about our situation. So, um, yeah, I've been told that in a lot of languages. So. <laughs> 
Um, so, so I, I appreciate the question, and, and, and I, I, I would put as much emphasis on those basins that don't have a, agreements, helping to support those basins come to agreements that have local values and local mores and local uh, data sources, um, as I would maybe thinking about kind of the global, uh, global values that we may want to impose uh, worldwide. I don't know. Help me out, man. Um, but just, just to add, I will definitely second you. So, for example, World Bank was involved in, um, you know, like some of the negotiations, right? But if you talk about the case of Central Asia, then just like what Aaron said, they would say, you know, foreigners. Even I work for international, sorry, I work for international organizations, but sometimes um, uh, when I speak, some people assume that I'm also a foreigner, but I'm from Central Asia, you know, so then I remind, I, I do understand the cultural differences. I grew up, it's not like something, you know, that, that, that I, I learned, you know, like I'm from here. Uh, but I completely agree, some, some parts of the world, it's just, they're not going to welcome. All right, back to the room. Microphone, yes, please. Hello. And thank you guys for being here. Um, all your work is really exciting and very interesting. Um, and I definitely agree with the um, uh, comment that all the data that we collect won't necessarily give us the outcome that we need. And I think a lot of people here are kind of circling around some of the same concerns um, regarding consequences or the lack thereof for not um, upholding treaties, which uh, we just, you know, we talked about. They're, they're kind of, sounds like optional. <laughs> um, if the US uses up all the water and doesn't let much get down into Mexico, what are, what is the plan or is there any, you know, consequence for that? Or what about at, at any level, if there's private ownership of say like the Ovalala aquifer, is there any way to make a private owner share uh, the water that supports the bread basket? Um, so yeah, we have to treat groundwater and surface water separately. Um, but what about um, you know, like going into crisis mode a little early, thinking about um, deep sea seabed drilling for aquifers in areas that no one owns? So. The UN really doesn't have any way to enforce any of this. So is there kind of a firmer plan in, in the wings for when these uh, you know, water restrictions do become national security issues? I think that would be really interesting to know. Well, I mean, I think one way of addressing that is for what recourse do you know injured parties or those that are missing out or lack control of a water resource? What recourse do they have when they feel like they've been injured due to another actor's taking some water? Well, it depends where you're talking about. Um, if it's uh, Mexico, U.S., and it's the Mexico side that it's being affected, if they are aware. They are affected. They might not be aware. Um, there's nothing you can do, uh, except you can rely on, you know, the draft articles of transboundary aquifers of the UN, and those principles that are very that already uh, mentioned as well. Um, in the case of the US, or in the case of Texas, for example, so is the rule of capture. You can extract as much water as you can as you want regardless of the impacts to your neighbors, domestic or, of course, international. So it, the, the regulation actually protects you uh, for not being responsible. Um, yeah, this was, you know, 19, early 19s. Things have changed. Regulation has not changed. So I think that we are seeing right now is the limits of the system as we know it on how that, I guess, negligence from sharing parties has taken us to on a very unsustainable future, a very irresponsible future. But because precisely of that, there's nothing really uh, 
that we can grab for or we can call for to protect both the resource or the users, not in terms of groundwater. Surface water is different, but groundwater in the border, it's, what is it? Salvese quien pueda, you know what that means? Uh, no, nobody knows what that means. It's like, you know, a, a gray area, you can do whatever you want to do. But don't say that out loud. <laughs> it's a good thing they're not recording, right? Or webcast. <laughs> All right, I think we're gonna, we only have a couple minutes left, so I think we'll take, yeah, one more. Go ahead, please, here in the room. Yep. Well, thank you. I'm Frederick Drummond. I'm with the National Science Foundation. I just recall the many discussions about the importance of international institutions who manage water boundaries and whatnot. And while we discussed a lot of negatives, I was wondering if we could be uh, give a few examples of some really effective institutions and what factors made them effective, and if those factors could be replicated in other institutions. Oh. All right, can we get in on a positive? Uh, we yeah. do that. That's a how great. Much, how yeah. much time do we have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one minute. So let's let's do this. Let's 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 hear. It's going to wrap up from yeah. each one of you. Yeah. And so I think tackling that question in terms of uh, a good news story in terms of international institutions that were helpful and effective, and then any other key messages you want to leave the audience with. Aaron, you go first. Thank you for the question, first of all. I think there's a lot of good news in water. I think the fact that there are seven, 700 treaties uh, around uh, water resources, and they're very rarely broken. They're almost always upheld, that there hasn't been a war over water for 4,500 years, that we, when we interact over water, two out of, out of three times, it's cooperatively and not conflictively. I think that's really, really good news. We have rich history of dialogue. And on the specific agreements, I think, as I said before, every basin is unique. And so the ones that are successful are successful for unique things. So if you look at the Indus Basin Agreement, it's, it's not a stellar agreement, but it has a stellar conflict resolution mechanism. It has three steps. And so the first thing is they try and solve it at the technical level, then at the political level, and if they can't, it comes to binding arbitration here at the World Bank. And since 1960, when it was signed, over and over, politicians have said, we're gonna withdraw, we're gonna withdraw, we're gonna withdraw, and they never ever have, and they followed those three steps precisely and have shown up once here at the World Bank for binding arbitration. Thanks for the question. Yes. Quickly, yes. Uh, we have successful transboundary groundwater agreements out there in the world. The Genevieve Aquifer between Switzerland and France is a very successful one. It's a kind of the case. Uh, the Warrani Aquifer, for example, in South America has just been, uh, a couple of years ago, has been ratified. Uh, you know, it's one of the largest in the world as well. And then between Mexico and the U.S., apart from everything that you've heard, I mean, there are success stories within the border especially between Arizona and Sonora on Mexico side. Again, localities plays a role, history plays a role. And actually the Rio Colorado Basin, I mean, they have been able to even adapt the treaty based on a lot of stakeholder interaction and inclusion of a lot of uh, communities. We cannot say the same for the Rio Grande, but we do have that lessons. Good, they're not perfect, of course, but they are good lessons learned in terms of participation, in terms of successes on agreements, intensive agreements on anything, but as far as they agree on something, you know, it's a success. So we do have those examples, and, and thank you for the question again. We need to talk more about the successes because we have enough problems, right? <laughs> we can always talk about the problems, but the successes and how we can learn from there, from them and try to apply it to another regions of the border between Jukes and Mexico, for example, or, you know, uh, or, or the recent uh, treaty uh, ratification and the Nile Basin, how that actually came into force. I mean, there are, nothing is going to be perfect. There are always things that we can improve, but those lessons are worth exploring. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, thank you. So uh, from my example, uh, from in Central Asia, the role of international organizations like the IVMI, International Water Management 
organization, whenever we bring together uh, representatives from uh, two countries, you know, who um, if they just get to know each other better, then we're already contributing to a success. You know, every time we uh, create a workshop or training and we're, if we bring these people together, then there's less likelihood that, uh, you know, they, they will uh, not cooperate. The likelihood of them cooperating will actually increase. So that's where I guess it starts even if they don't sign an agreement. That, that's, I think, the, uh, the success right there. All right. Please join me in giving a round of applause for our panel.